Hi, my name is Janine Marziani. I'm the Ohio State President for Bank of America. And I want to talk to you about two things. One, I want to tell you a little bit more about the Caramu House. And two, I want to talk to you a little bit about voting. Voting is such a vital, important part. Nobody can force you to get out and vote, but many citizens do vote because voting gives us an opportunity to let our voice be heard. It allows government officials to know what's important to you and your family so that they can make a difference. They can drive action against things and issues that are important to you. If you think that one vote doesn't matter, consider that some of the closest U.S. elections have come down to the last votes counted. I want to also tell you a little bit about the fact that we're proud as Bank of America to sponsor the series Freedom After Juneteenth with the Caramu House. It's a series of theatrical productions, panel discussions, where they talk about racial injustices that currently exist in America today. As one of the oldest African-American producing theaters in the United States, it is an incredible theater to be able to demonstrate some of the things that are happening. I encourage you to go out onto their website, check out some of these series, really get to know them a little bit better. This series will talk to you a little bit about voting too and why it's so important. So thank you again for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, again, check out the Caramu House and check out these um, productions so that you have an opportunity. Get out and vote. Thanks again and appreciate your time. We welcome you into sacred space, onto ground that is legendary, into space that summons joy and pride. We welcome you to Caramu House. When segregation ran rampant in our history, we welcome all as freed slaves migrated north. Our home was a place of refuge. Founded by the Jellifs, Rorina and Russell Jellif set new standards. A Jewish couple with the vision to unite and to uplift. A vision with an unapologetic value of diversity. An unapologetic commitment to excellence in the arts. Welcome to our home, a place that witnessed the lies society tried to push, that African Americans were not enough. A place that witnessed the abuse of African Americans physically and mentally and decided to make a difference, to be the difference. A place that decided to take a stand, a place that became a home to cultivate the work of artists with a special honor to black artists. The home where Langston Hughes wrote verses and taught poetry, where countless playwrights of the Harlem Renaissance received support and space to develop their artistry. Shirley Graham, Conrad Seeler, Andrew M. Burris, Willis Richardson, and Zora Neale Hurston works were advocated for and produced with excellence. This is a place of inclusion, a place in which the halls were graced by Martin Luther King Jr., where the largest number of buses left Ohio to attend the March on Washington, where Rosa Parks spoke, a place for collaboration, a place that is firm in its integrity. This is Karamu House. Karamu, a Swahili word meaning a joyful place of gathering. We are a place of joy, where stories and dance, music and art are shared with quality and shared to make impact. Where programming, education, performances unite, showing the beauty in all of us, the talent in all of us, the value in all of us. For 105 years, we have been here in Cleveland, Ohio, where names known and unknown, young and old, have left marks that will never fade. Vanessa Bell Calloway, Ruby D, Imani Hakeem, Langston Hughes, and James Pickens Jr., and countless others. The place that is for you, for me, for all. Welcome to the legendary Karamu House.
Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Freedom After Juneteenth. A special thank you again to Bank of America for their support of this original Caramu House series. Also, thank you to First Energy and Women Vote for their additional support of this episode. I am Tony Sias, President and CEO of the historic Caramu House, and tonight's episode focuses on one of the most central topics of the day, voting. The word voting is everywhere, almost echoing off of our screens. But that's the problem. We're still seemingly working to convince people to harness their power and their right to vote, their voice in their vote, and their power when they vote. In 2018, while we saw record highs of voter turnout in the USA, that turnout still only meant that 54% of eligible voters went to the polls. In numbers, that means that 145 million eligible voters in this country didn't vote. Yes, there are some voters who just chose not to go to the polls. But you know, it's a bit more complicated than that. Laws have been put in place to hold back the black vote, from uh, identification requirements to poll place closures. But we must persist. There is hope that voter turnout in November 2020 will be the highest that we've seen in, in the past century. We present you with episode two of Freedom After Juneteenth to encourage you to rise to that challenge. Caramu House continues to come to the screen because we believe that an artistic response to the issues of the day are vital for conversations and dialogue and action to take place. And as America's oldest producing black theater, it is part of our responsibility to both entertain and inform and now activate viewers like you to be a part of a more just and equitable society, especially for members of the African-American community. From Good Trouble John Lewis, the vote is precious. It's almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent tool or instrument that we have in a democratic society, and we must use it. Enjoy tonight's performance. But also, please do two very important things. One, make sure you and everyone in your household who can vote is registered to vote. And two, make sure you and everyone in your household also votes in the November election, either by mail or at the polls. Vote. It's your right. It's your power. So what now? We got to get out and vote. Vote? My vote don't count. My vote don't count, so you can scream and shout. And I'm still going to tell you that my vote don't count. Cause they got voter suppression They use that as a weapon to add to the oppression So answer this question Why would I vote in a nation I don't trust When we try to get ahead But they walk all over us The problems that we're going through exceed a small amount And my struggle is the last thing that they take into account That's why my vote don't count You can scream and shout And I'm still going to tell you that my vote don't count So miss me Shame, shame. A pandemic is raging, we all in quarantine While they lie and perpetrate abuse against minorities Gerrymandering is widespread, they do this on the sly When they need the extra votes, so the districts they divide Corruption is cutting deep and I'm starting to feel There ain't no vote and I can do to make these wounds heal That's why my vote don't count So you can scream and shout And I'm still gonna tell you that my vote don't count So miss me Shame, shame. You don't know I'm sorry Don't you feel us in your face Feel us in your face My vote don't count Hey. They got this crazy system called the 
electoral college But it ain't about no learning And it ain't about no knowledge It's how the votes are counted Mail in or in person So no matter who we vote for We gon' get they version Don't just think of all the struggle Our people have gone through it Just to cast your vote And they ain't gon' use it That's why my vote don't count So you can scream and shout And I'm still gon' tell you That my vote don't count So miss you yeah, Don't count. Shame, shame. You can't hear my story. Don't you feel us in your face? Feel us in your face. My vote don't count. Love memory. Love memory. Love memory. Love memory. Shame, shame. Don't count. Shame, shame. You can't feel my story. Don't you feel us in your face? Feel us in your face. My vote don't count. Feel us in your face. Feel us in your face. My vote don't count. It's cool, it's cool, and I love you. Don't, Don't you, you feel us in, in your veins? Your egg on protect, your bloodline. Don't, Don't you, you feel us in your, your veins? Roderick Carmelo Wells, we need to have a word with you, sir. Now, wait, wait, wait. Now, are we supposed to have masks on, or should we just stay six feet apart? Or is it both? Six feet apart is good, since we aren't living, and we are family. Family? Weren't you listening to something with your a goon, your ancestors, your family? We would hug you, but evidently your generation doesn't know how to wash their hands. And I'm passing around some sickness, so uh, we'll keep our distance this time. Mm-hmm. Wait. My mother has your picture. Oh, oh, good. Your grandmother Norma held on to it. I do miss her. I'm your great aunt Meredith, and you are the son of Rachel and Derek, the grandson of Titus and Norma, and Paul and Mary. My great-great-grandson. I'm your grandpa, Junebug. <laughs> I'm your pop-pop. Your however many great-grandfathers and the last free slave of your bloodline. And I am Mama Jean. All you need to know about me is that I am great, and I am old, and I am your grandmother from the motherland. And no man, woman, or child in this family accepts the idea that they somehow don't count or matter. Don't matter? <laughs> Wait, are y'all here because of what I said about voting? <laughs> Wait, y'all are dead, so how did you... How was it possible... Death isn't really an ending for our people, honey. And we are not here to talk about the secrets of life. We're here because you and so many like you are failing to vote. Failing to honor what we sacrifice so much for. We step in when we know it's necessary. And honey, this is necessary. He get that no thinking nonsense from June bugs out of the tree. Pop, pop, don't you start with me now. Stay focused, gentlemen. Beaten, abused, misused, and even lost our lives. 
Don't see the obstacles they set out for you. And baby, what you're facing, it ain't new. Oh, they always tried. They always tried to keep our hands tied with dogs and threats and laws to keep us victimized. But, but son, son, we, we all, all fought. fought. We marched and we were beat. We, we fought. fought. Some of us killed in the streets. We, we fought because, because we, we knew that, that voting was, was the key, key to, to be, be free. free. Laws bring on change. The writing and the laws released our change. But the laws created more change. That's why you have to get out and vote. Change, change may, may seem impossible, impossible but, but it's possible, possible for, you. for you. Change may seem impossible, but it's possible for you. Look, I'm going to apologize in advance, but y'all just said a whole lot of nothing. No offense but I believe that voting made a difference in 2008. I can proudly say that I voted for the first black man to be in the White House. I was proud to be a part of that. But y'all know what happened after that? Nothing. The policies were still twisted. They were literally poisoning families in Detroit. And I kept trying to hold on to this idea that, that voting made this big difference, even when nothing was changing around me. In 2016, I wish Bernie Sanders would have made it to the election. <laughs> but you see how that turned out. It was my first time voting in the primaries, and nothing happened. My vote did not count. It did count. He just didn't have enough support. You can't just wish someone passed the primaries. You have to vote. In 2016, the state of Michigan had 277,000 black people registered who did not vote. And 45 won Michigan by 11,000. Y'all need to show up. Okay, well, why would I vote when I don't like any of the candidates? If you all was active in voting consistently, the candidates you like would come to the forefront. And do you know what your bloodline has endured? What I went through to vote? Okay, Meredith, it's obvious he doesn't. 1776, only white men over the age of 21 could vote. 1868, 14th Amendment, all men could vote and were free. But there were poll taxes and tests to prevent many of us from actually voting. We couldn't pass a literacy test, so they called us dumb and sent us home. I never got the chance to vote. 1920, white women could vote. 1924, Native Americans could vote. 1964, the Civil Rights Act passes. That's when black women could vote with everyone else, and the poll taxes were eliminated. In 1975, the literacy tests were eliminated. Okay, and just because they gave you the right to vote doesn't mean that they made your vote count. That's true, but the fact that we can vote gives us the opportunity to make sure our vote counts. Voting counts in numbers. Voting-related policies are always changing and will continue to until this country gets it right. And there are more people in your generation that want to get it right than there were when we were alive. I don't understand why y'all are here now. Why is it so important for me to vote now? 
Why didn't y'all show up in 2016? That was a mess of a year. I made them come. Your bloodline traces all the way back to Mississippi. I feared registering to vote. I knew people who were beaten, who lost their jobs, their homes, and their lives because they were trying to register to vote. If you went into the office to register, your name would appear in the newspaper with your home address, and you were targeted. I was beaten three times, twice before walking into the office and once for helping someone else. Our home was bombed because my name was listed in the papers after registering. And when the time came, I voted. I voted with my tongue clenched in the gap where my back teeth were kicked out. I reached out for the pencil, barely able to open my hands fully due to the burns I had and the way my skin tightened while healing. I could barely stay standing without my cane because my legs weren't the same after they were stomped during the beating. I cried as I voted because I had friends and family who were killed. And I was doing the very thing that they dreamed of. I had chills as I filled in the ballot. It was me. It was me thanking her for allowing me to vote. Local officials aren't beating us like they used to, but they are still injuring us by purging our names off the voter registration list. And all that nonsense at the post office is just to stop your mail-in ballots. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if all this COVID nonsense is a conspiracy in itself. The illness is real. And the obstacles it creates for voting are real. Now, just like you all came out to protest, y'all need to come out and vote. Voting is the protest. Now, voting didn't turn out exactly how I wanted it to, but I voted. And my bloodline voted in the first black president. If you vote, there is at least a chance that you can make a difference in this country, built by our ancestors' blood, sweat, and tears. If you don't vote, you are doing nothing for yourself and nothing for those who will come after you. I didn't know. A lot of our children don't understand the depths of our story. But you know it's important to vote because our right to vote has been under attack ever since we were even considered to be free in this land. They wanted a democracy for themselves, but that had to change. We are the disruptors of inequality. We are fighting. You have got to vote, son. Vote for me. Vote for you. Vote for all of us. Hey. Get into that meeting, too. Roderick, I didn't think you were coming. I didn't think I was either. Well, I'm glad you did. We were just talking about voter mobilization and registration. Sorry, Charlie. Continue what you were saying. Thank you. I don't think we should get wrapped up in parties. We should get wrapped up in policies. Unfortunately, many of us, regardless of race, will choose someone because they're connected to the Democratic Party or they call themselves a Republican, and that is ill-informed voting. The last few times I voted, I was clueless about the down ballot, so I just voted for all the Democrats. And what's the strategy in that? You do know there will never be a fully Democratic or fully Republican Congress, right? We need to come to common ground on some candidates regardless of party. I hear so many Democrats talk about how much they love what Governor DeWine has done and never would have voted for him because he's a Republican. Out of genuine curiosity, what was the green light for you to vote for Trump? I believed when I voted for him, I was voting for a brutally honest candidate, someone who would disrupt the corruption of the system. I do not like politicians, and I voted for someone who doesn't care about race, but took interest in money and law. I am a businesswoman as well, and his tax breaks have really helped me, so I feel I've been extremely strategic. 
well, we all have the right to vote. Yes, we do. If we all actually exercised our right to vote, I don't think the government would be in the shape that it's in. We would be so much further ahead if we all voted every time. I'm going to be honest. I gave up on voting. But I gave up because I felt like there wasn't enough change happening around me. I vote, and there's still an unequal playing field. There's still a crappy health care system. There's still an unfair education system. There's still a disproportionate impact on the black community in every aspect of living. I know my ancestors fought, but what if they were fighting for nothing? The system never wanted us, so why would our vote change anything? If we all voted every time for everything, everything would change. If we all, if we voted, all voted every voted time for everything, everything would change. If we all voted every time for everything, everything would change. If we all voted every time for everything, everything would change. If we all voted Y'all keep telling me to vote. But what's that gonna change? What's that gonna change? Cause even when I vote, ain't nothing gonna change. Nothing's gonna change. Y'all keep telling me to vote. But what's that gonna change? What's that gonna change? Cause even when I vote, nothing's gonna change. Nothing's gonna change. But what's that gonna change? Ain't nothing gonna change. But what's that gonna change? When was the last time you voted? In a presidential election, 2008. And who got your vote for a Senate in the House of Representatives? I, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, no offense. I just find it funny how the nation is so focused on the president when he or she is just a piece of the puzzle. Congress has power, and I'm sure you can't name five people in Congress and the platforms they ran on. Well, maybe not back then, but I feel like I'm more informed now. And I'm not ashamed to say what I don't know. Oh, I am not shaming. I am pointing out points of awareness. It's up to you what you do with it. Our votes are skewed in presidential elections because of the Electoral College. However, all other elections are based on popular vote. Everyone is so focused on the face of the presidency that they don't understand that he or she is at the mercy of Congress. We want all these things in change, and yet we don't show up in masses to vote for judges and local officials. Roderick, my heart dropped when you said your vote doesn't count. But seeing you here gives me hope that you will vote. And we can take the next Zoom meeting really breaking down candidates and policies. But there's no point if we don't take the first step of registering. Last time, you talked about how the system was built for the benefit of straight white men. I agree. I think we all agreed on that. So I think the system changed when the government made it legal for everyone to vote. It's why there have always been obstacles in front of black communities and so many others. They can't take away your right to vote, but they can make it more complicated to deter you. Yeah, poll taxes, literacy testing, disrupting the United States Postal Service. Taking away the right to vote from felons when blacks are always throwing the book when facing the, the legal system. And purging. They purge the voter rolls to eliminate as many people as they can from the process. Speaking of, you need to make sure that you weren't purged. Isn't it the individual's fault if they're purged? And I hate how it's called purging. It's more like cleaning in my mind. And it's legal. If someone hasn't voted in years, they have to re-register. What's unethical about it is when this happens, there is no process to inform the voter. Have you checked your registration? No. I mean, how do I? Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me grab my phone. I'm just going to Google check Voter registration. Uh, looks like it's on Ohio.gov for us. I got it. And while Roderick is checking his registration, I just want to reiterate that we have to show up to the polls every time, everyone. The gender gap is wide between 
black women and black male voters. It's been the pattern for 30 years. The voice of the black male voter is essential to making long-term changes. The gender gap is across all races. Women show up. An average of 4% more women vote than men. And that 4% is similar to the four points in 2008. 4% changes the outcome. I'm not showing up. I re-registered in 2016, so I should still be in the system, right? If you don't show up, you have to re-register. It takes about three minutes. And we'll wait while you do that. Are you all planning to go to the polls in person this year with COVID-19 happening, or are you going to mail in your ballot? I'm actually taking it a step further. I signed up to be a poll worker. I guess most poll workers are over the age of 60, and so with COVID-19, understandably, a lot of them aren't going to show up. But fewer poll workers means fewer polling locations and longer lines that some people can't afford to wait in. I'm open to volunteering. I don't do any unnecessary exposure to people. And honestly, I've been so distracted with everything that's going on, I didn't complete the early voting process. Does anybody know the deadline for requesting absentee ballots? The last day to request is October 31st, 2020 in Ohio. It's all on OhioSOS.gov. SOS? Ohio Secretary of State. As long as you're registered to vote, they'll send you your ballot and you can return it. Absentee votes are the first counted on election night, and I've got mine. Yeah, but they're disrupting the Postal Service to jeopardize this process. Conspiracy theories, the Postal Service is an outdated entity that we do not need. My mother's meds come through the USPS. It is needed. What's the deadline for registering to vote? Uh, it says here October 5th, so good thing I'm doing it now. <laughs> Guess I'm showing up suited and booted with a mask, gloves, and a shield to the polls. <laughs> We go to grocery stores. We can do a trip to the polls. I wish everyone thought like that. There are so many people that will be willing to go to the clubs and not the polls. I just wish that we could show up and show out at the polls. Because if we don't, the people that oppose our beliefs on equity and reform, they will show up and they will continue to dominate the government. I do support reform. No one said you didn't, Charlie. <laughs> We're all here together. We're all tied together in this world. It's not about always agreeing. It's about supporting human rights and justice. And you have the human right to believe in your beliefs. And we all should be able to have choice. You know, I don't think I've ever heard that genuinely said. I selfishly came back here because this is the only place I can give my opinion and it doesn't turn into a screaming match or somebody calling me out my name. I know some of you have been tempted, but I appreciate the restraint. We don't get anywhere by creating more conflict. My beef's not with you. It's the way this country is set up. You know, one thing I can't seem to get past is how much I don't like either candidate. I mean, why would I vote for somebody that I don't like? Right, it's like a game of would you rather. But all of this is a marathon, not a sprint. So I think if we choose the candidate that we would rather have in this moment, and if we're informed on the entire ballot, then I believe things will be better in the long run. But we can't continue the patterns of the last four years. When you do nothing, you get nothing in return. Well, I'm all set and registered. So I guess I'm going to do something instead of nothing. Thank God. Uh, we have to inspire as many people as we can to do something versus nothing. To vote and to be educated voters. Y'all know what would be dope if we had a virtual reunion at the polls. A what? <laughs> you know, families from all over come to the polls together or go online live before they go into the booth. <laughs> that actually sounds cool. Yeah, when we show up, it gives one of our ancestors who was denied the right to vote the chance to vote through us. Our vote honors our ancestors who were beaten and even killed for voting. My vote lets my ancestors know that I am using the door that they opened for me. If we all voted every time on everything, everything would change. If we all voted every time on everything, everything would change. I look forward to talking to you all next week. Oh, and don't forget to remind your friends and family that the deadline for the census is September 30th. See you all next week. Knowing your family's history with intimacy is not a requirement to understand their stories. 
But if you know any form, you know what they face. Stories of oppression, of discrimination and facing hate. Stories of taking stands, making choices, and selecting their fate. Fear and anger boils in your bloodline connected to the right to vote. You are the future ancestors. So tell me, what will the history books quote? I want the pages to read that 2020 was the year of the antidote, where record number of people showed up to the polls to vote. The year every race and every gender showed up in droves. The year families went to the voting lines, excited to leave their mark. Aunties, uncles, cousins, and grandparents, where no ballot had empty spaces. It's the year that made a spark. A spark for politicians that had their policies in order because the voters were significantly educated. The beginning of the masses holding these politicians accountable for every word that they stated. 2020 is the year where ignorance died and bigotry was absolutely unacceptable, where individuals thought of all people when selecting parties so that our system became equitable. A pandemic could not stop us. Obstacles could not block us. 2020 is the year when the United States said enough is enough. And it's not just black blood stained in the soil in the fight for change. It's the blood of slaves and Native Americans, Asian Americans, Jewish and whites. We've all been hurt by this country and we need to join together to make it right. In November, we vote and we do the same for every election. And we keep voting until the government looks like this country's true reflection. LGBTQ, various shades and hues, descendants of slaves and descendants full of hope when they arrived, descendants of immigrants and natives of this land who have survived. They told us this was the land of the free. And we will hold them to that. 2020 is the year that will make history. Those in favor of oppression no longer hold the majority. We are not the minority. We have the most authority. So vote. 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 Vote.
Hey everyone, my name is Romney Smith. I'm an anchor reporter at WKYC. That's the NBC affiliate in Cleveland, Ohio. And we thank you so much for joining us tonight for your panel discussion, Your Right, Your Power. So this panel was put together by the women from Women Vote. That stands for Visionaries Organized to Educate. The group of 23 professional women from the greater Cleveland area came together during the pandemic and they were talking and they all had the sole thing in common and the sole objective to inform voters of why their vote matters. Now, of course, you've all heard in the news or on social media that there are widespread issues going on right now. We're talking about voter suppression. When it comes to the United States Postal Service, there are long delays in mail time, and some people are predicting pretty long lines for early voting and in-person voting. Well, this group of women wants to encourage everyone to really understand why it's worth it to cast your ballot and that your vote does matter. Women Vote held several meetings via Zoom to develop an agenda, and one of the very first items that they launched was VoteOhio2020.com. I encourage you to check that out when you have a moment. Their website is meant to be a place where people can get information on how or where to vote, absentee ballots, important deadlines you need to know about, local, regional, and national races as well. Now, tonight's panel is actually the second panel that happened. The first one was called Your Vote Matters, and that was held last month, and it was focused on historical perspectives of how civil unrest impacted elections then and now. Today's panel of Cleveland community leaders will answer questions from young voters. Those questions, coincidentally, come from the women vote members and their younger family members. So let's get right to it and let me introduce you to tonight's panel. First up is Jade Davis, the Vice President of External Affairs for Cleveland Cuyahoga County Port Authority. In his current role, Jade manages the port's governmental affairs and communications programming. Prior to the role at the port, he served as the Senior Director of State Affairs and Outreach at the America Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity. Jade has also served as a legislative liaison to the Ohio General Assembly. He's married and has two kids. Jade, thank you for joining us tonight. We also have Stephanie Brown James, the co-founder and chair of the Collective PAC. Now, those organizations and Stephanie are very dedicated to supporting and funding black candidates to win elections on the local, state, and federal levels and the engagement of black voters in the political process. She's also served as a national African-American vote director for the Obama for America campaign. Stephanie is married. Her and her husband have two kids. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us. We also have Ricardo Leon, the executive director of Metro West Community Development Corporation, where he leads a multifaceted team of community development practitioners, offering a suite of services to three Cleveland Near West neighborhoods. Ricardo worked with several startup, corporate, and consulting companies before moving to the nonprofit sector. He serves on several boards, including Metro Health Foundation Board and the Front Steps Housing and Services Board. Ricardo, thank you for being with us today. And we also have Danielle Sidnor, the president of the NAACP Cleveland branch, as well as the founder and CEO of We Win Strategies Group. That organization is a firm dedicated to working with a diverse array of stakeholders to create win-win outcomes, of course, for individuals, organizations, and communities. Danielle has extensive experience in the banking and finance industry, and she's lived in Cleveland since 1995 and has two sons. Danielle, we appreciate you being here tonight. All right, guys, so let's all get started. I'm gonna jump right in with the very first question. You know, since the 2016 election, activism and political engagement, specifically with millennials and Generation Z, has grown a lot. While on one hand, some people are really excited to vote, on the other hand, some people feel like their vote simply doesn't matter. What would you say to a young voter, and anyone can start here, a voter who feels like they have nothing to lose by not voting this year? Well, I guess I'll start um, on on that answer. I I, um, I actually get this question asked me a lot from you know some family and friends. And it's not necessarily them, but it's people that they're engaging, whether it's uh, at uh, the supermarket or or the grocery store or, or whatever other limitation that COVID has placed this year on their engagement. There, people are hearing this like, well, why vote? Um, uh, simply put, from things I've heard is People say, well, the my neighborhood looks the same, uh, specifically my my uh, hood 
looks like the same under Reagan, under under both Bushes, under Clinton, under you know uh, President Obama, and 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 now. So, what has voting got me from then, and why should I uh, worry about it now? And I think that comes down to a serious disconnect in a couple different things. I think one civics and um, and and how much time is spent on that in school in a very real way, and what people are really getting in a very real way about civics. Um, and I think that that's just a, a issue with that when that needs to be addressed and how we educate our children about their government and about their role in shaping that government. Uh, and then two, I think in a in a community aspect. Uh, Simply put, folks, every each and every day, some of us that have been involved in campaigns, uh, that have been involved in politics, and this is what we do uh, for a living, uh, or that engagement of, of, of how, it inter- how it intersects with our lives is something that we pay attention to because we have to for our lives. The average American, um, and especially when you get to communities that may be more disadvantaged than others are so worried about surviving every day, um, they're not going to necessarily look at CNN uh, the same way I do. When I get home or I'm on my, if I'm sitting there before a meeting, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to check out the New York Times. I'm going to, I'm going to check out all these things. I understand what, uh, uh, I understand what, uh, what's going on at the state house. I understand what's going on at city hall. I understand what's going on in in, in, in DC. So long story short, uh, if you're not, if you're preoccupied with say, making sure you're going to get the rec- prerequisite hours you need to pay your rent at work, uh, you're going to be less occupied and trying to figure out why you, why you see the blight or why you see the lack of opportunities that you do. Um, and, and third, I think that even folks that people may look to that may know what they're saying and know what they're doing, uh, you'll see many people now um, saying, well, if we need a black agenda and we need to withhold our votes for that black agenda. And honestly, a lot of things on that agenda are things that's handled at City Hall uh, or there are things that are handled at the State House. And voting for your state legislature to represent you or voting for your councilman to represent you or your county executive or mayor or governor may have a bigger effect on your daily needs and maybe even president or Congress will uh, depending on, you know, again, who you are, and where you are in your community. Um, those kind of things, I think it's just a, a, there's even a disconnect from some of the influencers who may say these kind of things that they don't really know. They haven't really had the civics connection. And frankly, many of them are saying these things without spending a single time in politics or public policy campaigns or all these kind of things. And that's what people hear. And that's what people listen to. Um, And so I think all those things combined is why you even have this question. Why should you vote? Well, people died for it. Um, And voting is so important that uh, there's very there's people that want the government to make it harder for you to vote because it's so important. That you vote. Um, there are there have been people who uh, have done a lot of things. I mean, I tell people all the time: um, our grandparents, our parents, our great grandparents, all went through things um, in order to give provide the kind of life that we're sitting here. And so I, then I see somebody with two hundred dollar sneakers on or and three hundred dollar jeans and say, "Why should I vote?" Well, because your grandfather worked probably harder than you. Um, and never could afford whatever inflation adjusted that would have cost him then because he just wasn't allowed to make that. Uh, He wasn't allowed to have those resources. So that's why you should vote. And I think those are kind of things that we got to start having very real conversations with our friends and family about. You brought up some great points. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? I'll just add one thing to what Jade said. I had a conversation with someone this weekend about the fact that In their household, it wasn't that voting was discouraged, but they were uh, more prompted to just figure out how to go to school and get a good job. And so there are certain things that were beat into them and voting just was not one of them. And I think that to Jade's point about how we spend a lot of time talking about survival and the things that we need to do to basically thrive, 
sometimes in community, we can leave the fact that voting is one of those elements out. And so I think when you when you look at young people, we're often influenced and we're taught our first lessons at home. And so if our parents were in that same rat race trying to figure out uh, just simply how to survive and make sure that we were getting the things that we needed from the education system and everything else, there's a lot of competing priorities. So we do have to spend more time not assuming that people have the underlying understanding of what each office does and spend more time educating while encouraging people to vote and giving them some of the basic reasons to help them connect the dots because there's just so much. It was almost like we're in information overload as good and and as helpful as social media and all those things are, they also cause us to have so many competing narratives that people are trying to navigate what's actually accurate and factual. Danielle, I think you're spot on right there. And that's actually a perfect segue into my next question. So we do get an onslaught of information, not only from the news, but from our cell phones, right? We're all on Facebook. We have Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok. There's so many different outlets. And on all of those social media platforms, there are celebrities pushing out messages. Some are being very neutral and just saying, register to vote and go vote. Others want to support a particular candidate. So with the influence of celebrities, and we know that they influence young people, there are some, and Jay touched on this, saying that black people shouldn't vote. So when you've got someone like a celebrity and an impressionable, let's say 18 year old who can vote, but they've got celebrities telling them not to vote, why, what's the message that will get through to them to say, okay, this celebrity says don't vote, this celebrity's endorsing a candidate, how do you expect an 18 year old to really understand the importance of voting? Let's start with Ricardo. That's actually, I mean, a really good question. So uh, it's something that we see often, particularly dealing in working in uh, urban inner city communities, right? With high POC populations, um, kids don't feel the need that it's important, right? And like you said, there's celebrities telling them that it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and very similar to the la previous question, both Jade and Danielle touched on, um, the real reason to get, I think the way to get to folks is, and kids particularly, is every single day they live in communities where elected officials, right, decisions that were made by elected officials affect their everyday life, whether that's their schools, their libraries, their infrastructure. Um, and in order for that to change, right, whether they agree with the way their community currently looks or not, or they want to see change in the future, um, our kids need to understand that voting is the way to be to start down that path, right? To become civically engaged. When we think about civic engagement, you know, it starts with voting and it always comes up in voting cycles. Um, but we also think about, you know, uh, census, right? Being engaged in census work, being age, engaged with your local community, uh, working with your local elected officials, right? Understanding your ward and where your council members can help you. Um, because to Jade's point, there's a lot of stuff that happens at City Hall that many folks probably think comes from the White House, but you can actually change here and you can mobilize here. You know, And we see it in communities, um, particularly more affluent communities in Cleveland, um, where residents have kind of banded together and gone after different opportunities or pushed for different things or, or even blocked things from happening uh, because of the power that they have because of because they're civically engaged. And so really our answer, you know, we deal this with this a lot with kids is like, um, you know, you get that one vote, it might feel like it's not making a huge difference, but you are one piece of a greater puzzle that then can create this collective impact that can uplift your community. Stephanie, what would you say? Yeah, great question. And, um, you know, I, I think so much of, uh, of what dictates how younger people people vote is is actually a feeling that many people have um, voters and non voters um, into the celebrity piece. You know, one of the things um, in talking with a number of um, younger voters, potential or folks who are just still on the fence if, if they're going to vote or not, you know, one of the things and and I had the great <clears throat> uh, um, privilege at one point to to work for the NAACP Youth and College Division and our young people told us, listen, yes, we care what celebrities have to say, but we care more so about what our peers have to say. And we care more so about what the people that are directly impacting our lives on a daily basis have to say. What does my mom think about voting? What does my dad think about voting? What's my teacher or professor saying about voting? What's this community leader? What's my pastor saying about voting? So celebrity is important, but I don't want us to provide it with an outweighed sense of it being a number one motivating factor as to if young people vote or not. And and I think just going back to, you know, so much of how young voters feel is how all voters feel. This system was not set up for 
young people, people of color, women to vote. And yes, we do. We've had suffrage. And yes, we've been able to expand voting rights to young people 18 and above. But be clear that the democratic process, the electoral process in America was built for white men to vote, white land owning uh, white men to vote. And that that legacy continues to have ramifications to the state. This is why we have voter suppression. This is why, you know, a major reason why young people don't vote is because the system is not set up to help them vote. Most voters are, are, are having challenges voting because, I mean, if I have to figure out, let's just take college students. Do I vote at home or do I vote on my college campuses if th those are two different areas? Okay, do I have to, um, how do I register to vote? Do I have to show a state issue ID? What if I don't have one? What if I can't afford to pay for one? Okay, what if they're changing the polling location off campus where it used to be and I don't have transportation to get there to vote? There's so many barriers to voting that it just gives people the feeling that why bother? Why bother? And that on top of what everybody says so eloquently when there's not a connection between what happens in your every single day life is dependent upon somebody else making the rules for you. And so if I'm not drilled in daily, constantly through social media, through celebrity endorsement, through the politicians in my own community showing me the linkage between do you want your trash picked up on this day? Do you want clean, clean water? And it takes a person making a decision for all those things to happen. When those dots are not connected and people are, um, are, are not, are not met with an opportunity to vote easily, then it causes people being disparaged and feeling like, mm, okay, I think I'm gonna set this one out. So I think once we start to address a lot of these barriers and, and start to address the educational equality around civics, you know, we can get people in a better situation, young folks included for them to be excited about voting because they understand the importance that they have as a voter in the political process completely agree with that. I think that connection part, which almost all of you have touched on, is a, a crucial element to this entire discussion and the framing of it as well. Thank you for that. So I'm going to move on to another question. What suggestions would you offer up to a young person who feels like they don't have much money, power, or influence? They might be questioning, why should I stay engaged in a political process, even if it's at the local level? I don't have kids. Why should I care who's on the school board? What do you say to that kid? Yeah, you know, I, I, oh. I, I think one, one of the things that, um, as, as Stephanie was talking, I, I thought about is the young person and helping them understand how to hold people accountable after you vote. Because I think that's something we also don't spend a lot of time talking about. It's like, go out and vote. Okay, then I voted. And then what happens? If the person is not doing the things that you expect them to do in office, or they're not doing anything at all, or they're doing the wrong kinds of things, we have to also teach them how to be engaged in that. Uh, process of showing up at a city council meeting or organizing their peers, as Ricardo talked about, the number of things that have happened in my neighborhood because women got together, men got together and decided they were going to do a block club or this or that, that, you know, led to some sort of consistent, sustained movement. I think it's important that we help young people understand that. And you may not have children and maybe the school board is not the thing that motivates you primarily, but there's something in your neighborhood or community that you care about, whether it's your ability to go to a park and have a place to sit instead of having to stand because there's not a bench. And I think if we gave them more examples of how they could collectively use their voice to accomplish something, then it helps you to really start to build that um, inherent feeling of power. And it does help you understand, it doesn't necessarily take always financial resources, but the collective voice of many people coming together around the same issue can lead to the change that people want to see. Absolutely. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? No, I think she said it perfectly. Moving on to the next one. And this one is a hot talker. And I've talked with a lot of young people about this. On one hand, there are people like Kanye West, who is running for president, uh, Green Party candidates. They might want to get behind them. What would you say to a young person who says we don't need to have a two-party system, we need more options, and they want to vote for a candidate that we all know statistically has absolutely no chance to win? You appreciate their passion, but on the other hand, some would say don't waste your vote. So when it comes to the person who says, I want to vote for this candidate that is not at this point Joe Biden or is not Donald Trump, what would you tell that person? Let's start with Ricardo. 
this is a tough question, I think, because it, it does come up. We see this happen quite a bit, you know, as particularly, like you said, when talking to kids. Um, I think back to Jade's point earlier, uh, we there's a fundamental flaw in the way that we teach civics, right? And there's a fundamental flaw, particularly in inherently disadvantaged neighborhoods, right? Urban inner city neighborhoods. Um, where folks do not understand what that process looks like, right? So it might be like the cool thing to go put Kanye's name down on the ballot, but realistically realizing that that actually then hurts, right, the folks who maybe want a different candidate. Um, I think ultimately what we do, right, because again, we we are nonpartisan in all of our work, uh, we encourage folks to at least use their rights, right? But to, we at least educate them on how our system works, right, and why, um, you know the two-party system is in place, and why, how it has, how it's been in place, and and you know how it has been set up. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we can't, you can't dictate how someone votes, right? That's your right as an American citizen. Um, however, I think with more education, and particularly again connecting um, folks in in communities, right, that are inherently disadvantaged, um, which have the most up or downside based on which you know, person ends up in that seat, um, getting to folks in those communities and educating them on civics is really kind of where we can make change and how we can encourage folks, right, to, to make more informed decisions and be a more informed and educated voter. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it, you know, some people might still put Kanye on that ballot. I'm sure we're going to see some. I'm going to give a horrible analogy um, okay. and it's horrible because it's not exactly thought out, but I'm going to say it as I think it, um, this question reminds me of, and I don't know about y'all, but like, I used to, um, really want to be involved in talent competitions and talent shows when I was younger. Cause you see it on TV. They always have these episodes about, Oh, it's a talent show. And, you know, Usher's like, I got my big break at a little talent show in middle school and stuff. So let's say there is a talent show, right? And it's, and it's for young people to be a part of, um, young adults to be a part of. And, you know, there, is a, there, there are organizations that are promoting this talent show in certain ways they're promoting it. And you may or may not hear about it. Let's say you heard about the talent show. And then it gets to a point, and there's like people asking, who do you think should be in a talent show? Who should be in a talent show? And it gets to the day of the show. The performers are getting ready to get on the stage. And you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's wait a minute because so-and-so is not performing in a talent show. Well, I asked you, who do you want to be a part of the show? You had a chance to speak up and say, I think my little brother need to be a part of the talent show. Or this person, and, and even for the people who didn't know anything about it, somebody knew and you should have told them, hey, you got to say in who is in the talent show. And so I, 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 that thought came to mind because I, I do feel like at this point, when we are, as of tomorrow, 46 days from election day, yeah, in my opinion, this ain't the time to be thinking about, are you going to, uh, we don't need a Trump or, or, because it's also about math, okay? Like, elections are about math. Who gets the most votes to win? And sadly, in America, with the electoral college, some of the math is just all crazy all around. It's, it's hard enough. So I would say, yes. Do we need to have um, other systems, other people that are involved in the process on a presidential level? Absolutely. I, and I hope that one day we can have, um, you know, uh, we, we can have parties that adequately reflect the communities. And I think we are a long way from that. But the problem inherently with this question that I have is the amount of focus on the presidential candidates. When, as we've been saying, at the end of the day, the local and state folks who you choose to support will dictate the majority of how laws and policies impact your lives. So yes, might you vote for a third party ticket in this or not, or you know, someone who, who, who statistically does not have a chance to, to, if that's your prerogative to do so, okay? But be focused on who's running local and statewide because those folks who you have an opportunity to actually talk to, to sit down and meet with, to help give your suggestions on how you think policy should be enacted, to help you progress, to have, help your family and community to, to progress, I think is vitally important. And excuse me for that horrible example, but it was the first thing that came to my mind um, when you asked the question, Romney. Um, so right before we started this panel, there was a production that we all watched with by the Karamu House, and it was pretty incredible. So we're, we've talked about friends and the influence of family, and in that production, it was generations 
being able to speak to a young voter and them telling him, this is what we worked for. This is the struggle that your auntie had. This is something that your great grandfather had to deal with. Why is it important? Or do you think I should let me back up and say, do you think it's important for young people, even if they're not a voting age, to sit down with their parents, their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents to learn more about their individual family history and its connection? Do you think that that in and of itself would be enough of a motivating factor if they really knew that maybe their great grandpa marched in the civil rights or maybe their aunt's injury was from something that had to deal with race relations? Yeah, I, mean, I think that it, it's it's definitely um, important because I look at I have two sons that are 16 and 17 and they think everything has always been this way. That's what most people most people do. Right. You have never had to use a rotary phone. You've never had anything but Wi-Fi. They've not used dial up Internet. They've always had a microwave. They've always had the ability, you know, as Jay was talking about going on Netscape. I mean, you've got social media. You have all this stuff at your fingertips and they assume that life has always been this way. And so to think that when we're having this conversation, we're talking about things that people in our families like that are still living dealt with in the 60s, 70s, and before, it's easy for a, a younger person to not really have connectivity to that because it's glossed over in school. It's taught in a way that makes you seem like that was during slavery hundreds of years ago. Like we're talking about 1960, right? And when we started to, my mother lived at a time where she had segregated pools in her community. So this is not your even great grandparents you have to go to to get the history of what racism and discrimination has done and why voting has put us in a better position. Are we done gaining the access to freedom and equality? Absolutely not. But what we, what our parents and grandparents had to deal with, we don't have to deal with in the same way because folks got out and they held elected officials accountable and they marched and they protested and they withheld their dollars. So we do have to help them understand that things that just magically get this way, that we worked for it, and they have an obligation to do the same for somebody that's coming behind them. Let's talk about that historical context for a moment, because right now in this atmosphere, I'm sure we all know that there was a strong Black Lives Matter movement going on, right? We've seen the riots, we've seen the marches, we've seen the protests, we've seen the arrests, we've seen brutality, and we've seen very peaceful movements as well. A lot of people think this is new. Black Lives Matter is new without looking back and saying they might not have called it Black Lives Matter, but we've always marched. We've always rallied. We've always organized. We've always fundraised to try to make our community voices heard, our concerns, our living conditions, our abilities to, and our access. So people thinking that Black Lives Matter movement is new is debatable. I would say it's debatable, but it's certainly motivated a lot of people to want to vote. What impact do you guys think the Black Lives Matter movement will have on the election, whether it's gonna motivate people to vote for either candidate? Let's start with Ricardo. Yeah, I think uh, something that you know other folks have kind of brought up and, and is incredibly important, and you mentioned in, in the production, um, you know, this like the social uprising, right, in this movement, um, towards a more equitable future. It's something that's been going on for generations, right? And it permeates black and brown communities, particularly, right? Um, from MLK to Cesar Chavez to Pedro Alvis Campos, like we have a number of figures in our history that have fought, right, for our right to vote, have fought for, for change, have fought for a more equitable system. Uh, I wholeheartedly believe the work that what we're seeing, right, in this movement that we see today in this iteration of it, right? And it, uh, is only gonna encourage more folks to become civically engaged. Um, yeah, I'm sure it'll encourage folks on both sides, right? But ultimately a more engaged co you know, community is better for all of us, right? Uh, I think what's gonna be important and what's gonna really be the, the thing to see coming from this is how then this turns from just a movement, right? Of, like a social movement that's on social media and in the streets and how we start developing implementable strategies that can actually create real change, that can then get us that, that more equitable society that we're all pushing for. And I think that's what's gonna be most important. You know, our, our generations before us figured out some ways to make that happen, right? And led a lot, you know, made a significant amount of change and led the way. Uh, and then to Danielle's point, I think, you know, over time, particularly now with technology and like young kids, it's real easy to like 
be so far disconnected from that that you, you don't really see how that affects you today. Um, but I think now, particularly kind of flipping that on its head with social media and like kids being able to see that like day in and day out and actually not have to worry about, you know, who's giving them the information. They can just pull it up right on their phone and see it for themselves. Um, that is going to drastically change the way that like our youth and our future generations respond um, to situations like this moving forward. And again, I think hopefully, ultimately, um, it will become, it will create a more engaged society. And I just want to throw out a statistic really quick. It's not just black people being more engaged by Black Lives Matter. News reports state 82% of young Latinos saying they're now motivated to vote because of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I just want to be clear, it's not just black people motivated by the movement. And certainly we know that there are white people who have been uh, motivated as well and you know, recently experienced a racial awakening, as I like to call it. So certainly it's having an impact, a real world impact. Um, speaking of that, when we talk about candidates, we know that there is no perfect candidate right now. Um, a lot of young people are focused also on the incarceration of black people specifically. Many are looking at the candidates and looking at specifically when we're talking about presidential candidates, how they voted or potentially their past actions. Um, how does this affect the outcome of any election when we're looking at the candidates past, especially if what they're saying on the campaign trail is different than what they've done physically in the past? I'll let y'all decide who wants to start on that one. I. Uh... <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard so many different things about, um, you know, sort of um, candidates and their past actions and things like that, especially when talking to black and brown people. Um, uh, you hear a lot about, well, um, you know, Kamala Harris was, you know, a uh, DA and she put people in jail and, and things like that. And and again, it gets down to sort of civics things. Well, the charges that was brought was made in laws by legislators. So, uh, you know, that DA is one part of that job. And then two, um, to automatically assume that uh, one, one specific DA or one specific uh, case or, or all these specific cases are, are just... Uh, you know, or unfairly broad, or there's, you know, there's, there's none of these other things happen. There was a reason that person fell into the system that may be systemic and much bigger again than just that one, that one DA. Or when we talk about like, uh, you know, the 1994 crime bill. Um, I often go back and, and and tell people, some of whom grew up with me. I'm like, hey, I don't, I don't know if y'all forgot, but crack was pretty bad. Uh, in our communities back then, I, I I grew up on on Buckeye Road, and I s literally saw my parents' community and the community I grew up in go from a solid working class community to pretty much what you see now in a matter of three four years. And there were too many homeowners on there who didn't want more police, who didn't want longer sentences, who didn't want who didn't want people to to suffer consequences for whatever they was doing, whether selling, using, whatever. Uh, the politics of that time was very different within the black community. Uh, so to go back and then now the place to say, oh, that was just bad, it was this, it was that. Uh, and again, it was a legislative process. It wasn't just Joe Biden. It wasn't just one senator or one congressperson. Uh, even if you go back and, and look at the newsreels, the CBC actually supported the crime bill. Um, um, many of those members are still in office now. And so, uh, you know, whatever you think about this whole thing, again, I think it gets down to, you know, civics and sort of what we was asking the last in the uh, in the last question. But if you go back to the Caramu production, um, the young voter or the young person that was on the edge of not voting was able to get sort of that perspective of how we got here and i think again that is that is the disconnect uh within some of uh within some families within our community now because again uh they may not have that same connection with family to understand how they got here uh, and that's a whole nother i don't think that's a political issue at all i think that's you know societal 
and social due to all kind of other pressures. But I mean, I think that's the reason you, you see um, so much questioning about, you know, uh, candidates past and juxtaposing it to today, uh, because many people just lack the perspective of how and why. Um, you know, because again, if you had this conversation about the crime bill on my parents' porch in 1994, I, knowing my mom and dad, they probably would have been very supportive of that. They would have been very supportive of more police and police patrols and, and things like that. Uh, again, hindsight is 2020, uh, but that is that was not the start of mass incarceration. <laughs> that has started in America pretty much post-World War II for various other reasons. And so, again, um, I think that's what we got to start having those conversations uh, just in general with, with our influencers, with our family members and things like that. And also our elected officials when they're meeting with their constituents. I think to, to, to tag on here. I'm sorry, Danielle, go ahead. No, go ahead, Steph. Go ahead. No, both of you answer. So let's start oh. with Steph. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. Um, Thank you. And I think Jay brought up extremely great points and it just made me think of, you know, we, we often hear that we're in this cancel culture um, where someone can make a mistake and it's like, boop, you're dead to me, you're gone. Like we've, we've written you off and I feel like I, you know, we, we need to go from a cancel culture to a conscience culture and conscious meaning we are almost painfully aware of our surroundings. We're painfully aware of decisions that are being made. We're painfully aware of what is and is not progressing us f forward. And so I think it's important to review a person's history, their track record, how they voted. That's very important. We should know these things. We should also know what have they done to try to correct their record? How have they grown? How have they learned? Because no one, no one deserves to be automatically cancel when we haven't taken all the information to consideration maybe not no one some people deserve to be canceled but anyways um but when you're focused on 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 your conscious and you're focused on um understanding that we can look squarely in the past or we can also look at what's happening right before us in the present what decisions are certain people who are in office right now who are seeking re-election what are they currently doing you can focus on what someone did in the past but be painfully aware of what people are currently doing to make your life better or worse most importantly worse and when you are focused on the facts of the moment and not the feelings of the past i think it helps you to really tune into is this the best person to make my life better? Or do I just want to, cause I don't want to just feel better. I want to know that someone is making a decision that I had to say so in to actually make substantive constructive change. And that's why I love what Ricardo said about, you know, we're, we're not looking for easy fixes here. And unfortunately our society is all about easy fixes. It's about easy answers. But the voting and the political process is about the long haul, about creating systems and, and policies that can actually be implemented to move us forward. And that move forward doesn't take long. And, and the last thing I'll just say about the move forward, because as y'all will now know, I, I love absolutely corny examples. Um, I think about, you know, you can have a beautiful car. You can have a beautiful car. And I think about the protest movement as a beautiful, much needed car that I can squarely look at. I can focus. I can see it. I know what that means, what it looks like. I know how that car makes me feel. But you know what? If you don't have any gasoline in that car, it is just a memento. It's something to be admired, but not something that can get you anywhere. The voting process, the political process, civic engagement is the gas. And you got to have both. You got to have both things together in order to move forward. And so I am I'm hopeful because young people today are extremely arrogant and confident. And I love that about young people. And I think once they understand, oh, wait, I actually have a say so I actually can be empowered to create some rules and pick who's going to say what for me. I think when that moment happens, we are going to see such a political shift in power in this country. And because of that, that's why people don't want them to be aware and to have that consciousness. And they want to help them focus just on this cancel culture. Danielle. Yeah, so I think, you know, Steph went right down that path of uh, the evolution of people. And I think as a young person, if I looked at what I cared about 
20 years ago versus what I care about today, I would hope somebody gave me the privilege of watching me evolve and become better over time because life experience just helps you know more about if I, like Jade said, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? So there's a lot of things. I remember the crime bill. I had a cousin that was about, or uncle that was about to go away in California because of the three strikes law. But at the same time, I had a grandmother that was on the front lines fighting and, and trying to rid our neighborhood of gangs. And so I also understand that we didn't have the political will at that time from many members of the community to care about black lives in a way that would say, people aren't addicts because they have nothing better to do, but there are systems in place that made it easily for my father and his brothers to become crack addicts. It was set up and designed for them to. And instead of the empathy that we see for the opioid crisis to say, let me go help these black men who are strung out. The only alternative we were given in our community was send more police. So what do you ask for? I'm going to ask for the only solution you're providing me, which is more police, because I need my community to be safer. So if we were given the alternative of clinics to help people overcome addiction. We would have taken that route as well, but that wasn't offered to us at the time. And so many communities did fall into saying, yes, this is the best solution at the moment. But we know now we would never tolerate something like that because we see when the face of who has addiction changes, we have all types of ways of ridding our communities of these problems. And so I think that's another thing to Stephanie's point about young people becoming aware of the power that they have. They have the ability to say, we don't like the things that we saw in the past. And we're going to ensure as we get involved in the civic process that those types of solutions are not provided to communities. We're going to provide solutions that actually help our communities become better. Jade, you look like you want to say something. Yeah, I, and, and I, I think, um, um, you know, one thing my wife has, has, has taught me is like, you know, follow the women. And I think I think both Stephanie and Danielle have have hit on some things that I think we need to make sure we, we reiterate. Uh, because the, the reason people got behind the crime bill is because, again, that was the option. It was don't do anything or... Uh, be tougher on crime and when you have a mortgage and you're looking at your your uh, your home value your wealth being being attacked and all these kind of things uh, you're looking to try to get out uh, you're looking to try to figure out a way to protect that and that's what many people did and that's what the politics demanded back then um, but I think you know I, I talk to whenever I talk to young people um, and, you know, whether it's they come and, and shadow me at the port or anything like that, oftentimes, you know, sort of you, you'll be shocked how many of them have an understanding of mass incarceration or have an understanding of, of disproportionate uh, treatment within the legal system and things like you'll be shocked how many do. And I often, oftentimes tell them like um, the the opioid cri uh, crisis should be eye opening in that. Uh, when who was affected uh, changed, um, all of a sudden the remedies changed. I mean, heck, Narcan was created. You can bring people back now. Uh, uh, I did not see that when um, when it was, you know, uh, us. And I think th those kind of things, I think, should be, you know, we have to start talking to, to especially black and brown young people about, the very realities of, of how that power dynamic works and your participation in the process um, is going to be critical in evening out that power dynamic, period. If you can't sit on the sideline, you can't say, oh, I'm going to go play another game. You can't go say, oh, well, I'm going to start a whole nother chess board over here. Well, yeah, but the other chess board is still dictating how many pieces you even have in, your, in the new game you're trying to play. So you have to be very cognizant of, 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 of who you are. And, and this has to start. It can't start at 17. It can't start at 18. It can't start, you know, at the graduation stage. This is something that, um, again, some very local for many people, school boards um, ha, uh, need to be discussing how you get in, how you get a higher level of civics participation, even at the younger grades, elementary, middle school and starting kids. To where they ought to submit, they're looking like, okay, where do I sign up to vote at? 
Where do I sign up to go to these office hours at? Or, you know, uh, because you're going to pay taxes and those those dollars are going to be used whether you like it or not if you're not at the table. So a recent survey by the Center for Informational Research on Civic Learning and Engagement found that a strong majority of young people ages 18 to 24 specifically are paying attention to the 2020 election. But a third of them didn't know they could actually register to vote online in their state. So, Ricardo, I'll throw this question to you. We've heard the importance during this discussion of family talking to young people about why they need to register to vote, friends, you know, getting your friends to actually register. What can states do to better increase voter participation? Oh, I mean, I think every state's going to handle this a little different, but uh, I mean, getting uh, <laughs> getting stamps in the hands of folks so that they can submit, you know, everything out through mail, right? If we had a postal system that uh, would not have massive delays right now would be a start. Um, I think also seeding dollars into neighborhood-based or community-based organizations that then can help get word out as well, right? That's something that we've been able to see in our neighborhood particularly, and we're seeing in other neighborhoods in the city of Cleveland, right, is um, starting to kind of take that information from a state level or a federal level and then disseminate that neighbor that information in the way that people react to it, right? Um, particularly when you talk about language, right, it was one thing, both like the actual language that's in, I understand there's language barriers, but the way that you just explain things and the way that you provide it very similar to what Stephanie just mentioned, you know, graphics, getting it in front of them in a very simple way, um, but then also meeting them where they're at. It's just the reality that um, in many communities, uh, particularly communities of color, uh, disadvantaged communities, folks don't have the time and energy to go out and seek this information, right? So you literally, when we say like meet them where they're at, like we're literally posting up at the grocery store, catching people on the way out, right? Like going to the bus stop, going to places where people are already congregating and getting information to them. And that, unfortunately, the state can't do that from like a state level because they don't have the capability to get into the neighborhoods, but they can they can install the really the funds, quite frankly, or at least the resources to an organizations that can get in front of folks in that way. And I think that's something that we you know we need to be relying on our community and neighborhood based uh, organizations um, and, and institutions and networks that can get this information out to folks in the way that they can consume it. And every community is going to be different. Every neighborhood is going to be different. Every age group and and race and ethnicity that you meet with is going to is going to need that information differently and we need to be able to pivot to provide it in the way that is most useful to them. I want to ask you guys one more question before we bring in our special guest for the night. So, and this one is something that I hear a lot of young people get very frustrated about and it's the electoral college because in most things in life and whether it's American Idol or local races, it's whoever has the most votes wins. It's very easy. But we have an electoral college when it comes to president. So with some states, it's proportional. In other states, it's winner take all. Um, talk to me about the frustrations with the electoral college, because some young people say, well, you can win the popular vote and not win the presidency, which we saw last election. So that makes them feel like, well, if I go to vote, but if my state happens to be winner take all, does it really matter? Does it really count? Because this electoral college thing makes me feel like it's more strategy than really each person's vote having an honest weight, I'll say. I'm like, I feel like I'll let Jay to answer the, the technical part of it. Um, Cause I'm sure he's, he's probably, I know he's way more briefed on electoral college than I am. You know, I would just say simply, um, you know, this is um, no matter what party you represent or you uh, think that you may support, this is an election where we cannot have a close election. Like someone needs to win this on the presidential. Let me say the presidential level. They need to win this thing so outright. There's no question. There's no question about electoral college. There's no listen. You know, Donald Trump won 2016 by 77,000 votes. To put that in perspective, that's not even Cuyahoga. That's smaller than Cuyahoga County, and we're talking about the entire country. And um, a big part of that, I mean, I think about Black people alone. Over 1.5 million black people in like six states didn't come out to vote who are registered. Um, not to say that that would have swung the election anyway. And this is a nonpartisan conversation. But yes, the Electoral College is a thing. But so is the lack of voter participation. 
And so um, I think for us to be able to squarely focus on what do we need to do to expand the vote? I, I am for conversations around how do we amend or get rid of the Electoral College. I think we should actually really look at that. But I also really love the validity of conversations that talk about same day voter registration as you can register to vote and vote the same day. You know, conversations around if you're going to do, you know, vote by mail that we are providing ballots. I mean, we're, we're providing um, um, uh, stamps, as Ricardo said, we're providing stamps for people to be able to mail their stuff in. You know, I, I think that all of those um, there's so many solutions that you have automatic voter registration as soon as you turn 18 years old. That the first time you step in to get your license renewed, you're automatically registered to vote. I think there's so many solutions to help expand the vote that we're not talking about as much or really putting putting legislation um, in to have these things um, become reality because we're focused on so many other things. So with that, I'll, I'll pivot to, to your actual to get an actual, actual answer to your question, Romney. I, uh, I, I, I wouldn't call myself the expert, Stephanie. Uh, you've been in the trenches even longer than me, so I'll, I'll defer to you with your doctorate in, in, in these things. But uh, I, I'll say this. Uh, the Electoral College, uh, and again, this just goes back to just uh, making sure uh, folks understand civics and, and history of civics in a real way. The Electoral College goes back to the debate among the founding fathers about how much democracy we would have. And, and, and I want to preface this by giving a little bit of a shout out to uh, Dr. Chendrai Komanika, who's at Rutgers and who's done a lot of research on this, on this subject. And um, when you look at the, the founding fathers and they was trying to start a country, the real story is, is that they just wanted England light. They didn't necessarily want a republic or 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 Athens based democracy. That all like what what they really wanted was to have some kind of not monarchy, but some kind of relationship where the elite males can rotate in and out to the make critical decisions and allow people to have free trade. Uh, because, again, the lack of free trade was really the reason the American Revolution was fought in the first place. And so when they say, OK, we got to start this country and people want some say, uh, the Electoral College was sort of started as a backstop to where electors can override the vote of the common folk who don't know enough um, and who aren't smart enough to make these decisions. So you have that just history. And then also you throw slavery in the background. It was a way for southern states uh, in order to get in order to as a compromise. And the reason we even had a three fifths of, uh, uh, rule within the original Constitution is so they can have more electors in the electoral college. Because oftentimes in many states, heck, South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Mississippi slaves outnumbered free uh, voting eligible whites. And so um, this whole electoral college is a vestige of both slavery and the original uh, founders weariness of common folk making these decisions. And what is end up morphed into is that it allows sort of it allows a opportunity for the minority to still rule over the majority, which we've seen in 2000 and 2016. Uh, I our country survived 2000. I think our country is going to survive 2016 and 2020. Um, but when you look at these kind of things, when you say, well, does my vote count or not? Um, yes, it do, uh, because if if Milwaukee or Detroit uh, or uh, neighborhoods in Pittsburgh and some of the surrounding suburbs would have had even just normal uh, 2012 or 2004 or, or 2000 turnout, uh, you have very different election results on election night. Uh, and so if you are in those areas and um, you don't like what the last four years have looked like, then you can just look to your cousin who didn't vote and be like, you're part of this, aren't you? 
Um, and I think those are the kind of those are the kind of real conversations that we 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 should be having in, in black and brown communities because one thing I do know for sure, uh, whatever is if if things are going bad or things are downtrending in America, it's a downright crash in 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 our in many of our communities and. So sitting on the sidelines is just not a viable option, and we shouldn't give uh, mostly brothers. Because um, one thing I, I will say is that black and brown women voting, they vote uh, at very very high levels. And oftentimes, it's brothers who sitting around and and pontificate the barbershop to each other, like, "Yeah, I don't need to do that. Forget that. I'm not a part of that." And all these kind of things. Uh, we have to get beyond that because. Again, the stakes are high because our rights are always on the ballot, even when it isn't on the ballot. It's always on the ballot. Um, and, and that's something that I think we have to be very cognizant of. We talk about does my vote count or not? Yes. What did I just Professor Davis? Like, who's not going to come into his class? <laughs> he hit it. He, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like you gave us like present and history, bro. I love, love that. that. Sorry, I'm excited because I just, I, I love history. You just broke that down, Jade. So thank you for that. Right. I'm like, this is a whole podcast. We're going to call it Common Politics. Ooh, baby. <laughs> I like that. That was so perfect. All right. But this isn't just about this panel and just about us right here. We actually have a special guest that's joining us tonight, making a public service announcement. I'm talking about... Niambi Niambi. That's an actor that you might have seen in Mike and Molly or on Mercy Street or American Coco. He's a first generation Nigerian American and when he's not acting, he works with an organization dedicated to developing African emerging artists. So he's also a really big comic book fan and a huge gamer. So listen up. Hi, uh, my name is Niambi Niambi. Uh, some of y'all might know me as Samuel from Mike and Molly and some of y'all might know me as Jay DePersia from The Good Fight currently on CBS All Access. Uh, but if none of y'all know me, I want you to know me as Niambi the Voter. Hey, that's Niambi the Voter. Yes, I am a voter and I am here to urge you to vote. See, the legendary congressman and late great civil rights icon John Lewis once said, your vote is precious, almost sacred. It's the most powerful, nonviolent tool we have to create the most perfect union. See, John Lewis and others in the civil rights movement put their lives on the line so that we, you and I, could exercise our right to vote. Because they fight, we got the right. We got the right to vote because of their fight. And so, our best way to honor them, to honor that fight, is exercising that right by voting. That's why it's important to me, because I know that my vote is on the, the shoulders of the men and women who fought for me to have this right. And so I exercise that right. It's important for me to exercise that right. Now the whole notion of every vote counts, I've seen it happen. I've seen it in terms of my family. My parents moved to a certain district uh, and they vote in their election. The person they, that they voted for, the candidate they vote for in their, in their um, jurisdiction wins by two votes. Every vote counts. And then, I, you know, the whole idea uh, of just sitting on the sidelines and, and sort of just uh, shouting about the issues, about the complaining about everything, uh, you know, what, what is happening in my, my neighborhood, in my communities, uh, and, not, and not voting is like a fan on the sideline, just yelling at the players and uh, the coaches. Um, and really not doing anything um, to, uh, to exact change. As a voter, I'm on the field. As a voter, I'm in the game because I exercise my right to vote. Now, you can vote, um, you can vote by mail, you can vote early, you can vote uh, in person on November 3rd, and then you can vote in other elections beyond that. See, we need you. We need every voice to be heard through the vote. And 
you don't have to just vote in the national elections. There are other elections you can vote for. Not only the, the President of the United States, but you can vote for your mayor, your alderman, your, your uh, city council, your school council. There are so many different positions in the grassroots um, that have elections that need your voice to be heard. I'm counting on you. See, together we can create the change that we seek. Because our voice is our vote. Vote y'all. Hello, everyone. On behalf of Women Vote, I extend a heartfelt thanks to our panelists, Jade Davis, Stephanie Brown James, Ricardo Leon, and Danielle Sidnor, and to our moderator, Romney Smith, for speaking plain truths that young voters need to hear. And we also extend a special thank you to Cleveland's own Karamu House for its opening production entitled Voting, the second in an episodic series, Freedom After Juneteenth. And to our special guest, Niambe Niambe, actor, writer, and author for his personal message to young voters as well. Tonight was the second of two panel discussions brought to you by Women Vote, Visionaries Organized to Educate. As Romney stated at the top of the program, Women Vote was formed simply to encourage community discussion and help educate you as to why your vote matters as we head toward the 2020 elections. Our first panel focused on the historical perspective of voting. However, tonight's discussion brought us forward and focused on the concerns of young voters today. What's in it for me? Why should I vote when my candidate isn't even in the race? Why should I care? Nothing benefits me anyway. Well, we hope that tonight's program was thought provoking and informative enough to answer those questions and more. Young people, your voice is powerful, so use it. This summer's uprising following the death of George Floyd triggered an outpouring of youth advocacy. Black Lives Matter grew to become the largest movement in US history. But here's the question. Will this movement only last a moment or will you register, exercise your right to vote on November 3rd and push for change in your own communities? As Ricardo said this evening, Sitting on the sidelines is not a viable option. Young voters have the power to lead and realize the solutions to help their own communities. Our first panel was a historical conversation on the impact of protests from the 1960s had on the elections. As I said before, we needed to look at our past to understand our present and open our eyes to the future. Young people, we need you. We need you to register and vote. Parents of young people, we need you too. September 22nd was National Voter Registration Day. Are you registered? Okay. Know anyone who isn't? In Ohio, you have until October 5th to register to vote. If you're not registered, you can take care of that today by visiting the Women Vote website at voteohio2020.com. You can also request an absentee ballot and vote by mail. We live in a democracy and many have fought and died for the right to vote. Let's not forget the work of John Lewis and others who dedicated their lives to improve the conditions and opportunities of the disenfranchised in this country. As the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, fight for the things you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. With your vote, you have the power to change things. Let's make those who came before us proud. Yes, your vote matters. Thank you.